Hello. This is a review about hardware and uh, operating systems. We will use the knowledge to be reviewed here over and over. Therefore, in the future, if you feel that you missed something or you don't know something or you have something in doubt regarding some idea I talk about in the future uh, videos, please come back to this unit and uh, watch it again. This unit is rather short, but important and crucial to the understanding of our future lectures. So the first thing is multiprocessor system. You will learn more in a, a parallel computing or computer architecture course, but here we only review what will be needed for this course. What is a multiprocessor system? Also referred to as parallel system or tightly coupled system. Such a system have more than one CPU cores. Why do we need a multiprocessor system? It has some obvious advantages. First one, increased throughput. That is to get more job done. For an example, suppose you have one CPU to run your system. Adding one more CPU on that CPU, you are able to run some other jobs. So in a unit of time, you will get more jobs done. The second one is economy of scale. Because the computer system has all CPUs built into a box, all of these CPU share the memory, files, and so on. So in this case, you do not have to buy multiple computers and connect them together with some kind of a network and so on. Therefore, using a multiprocessor system is usually cheaper than buying multiple computers and connect them together. And finally, increased reliability. In a single processor system, if the CPU dies, that, CPU, that system dies. With a multiprocessor system, if the operating system works with the hardware, it is always possible that even though one CPU dies, other CPU can still pick up the remaining work and uh, execute all the needed work properly, although it could be a bit slower. So these are the advantages in using multiprocessor system. But for today, most multiprocessor system would follow the so-called symmetric multiprocessing. S from symmetric, M from multi, P from processing. In such a system, that is SMP system, each processor performs all tasks under the control of the same process, of the, under the same operating system. All processors are peers, no special relationship exists. In the very early days of multiprocessor system, there was a concept called master-slave system. We have multiple processors, one of them is assigned the job of the master. The master runs something, say the operating system and assign the jobs or computation tasks or input output operations to different computers. Those, those processors are referred to as the slaves. One of the very well-known uh, system was the early CDC Cyber 6000 series. 
CDC here means control data cooperation rather than the uh, central disease control center. Now the CDC is gone to a uh, service company, but one of the major engineer who designed uh, these fa very fast supercomputers, Cray, created the Cray computer system. So in this uh, symmetric multiprocessor system, we have multiple CPUs. Here, we show you three CPUs, zero, one, and two. I'm sure you learned it uh, some time ago. Each CPU has its registers and the cache memories. These CPUs would access the shared memory through a system bus. So the, each CPU carries the information from memory into register and performs register to register computation or memory to register or register to memory computation. So these CPUs communicate with each other through a system bus. The operating system can run on any CPU. There's no special uh, task for a, speed, a CPU to do. Therefore, each of all of the CPUs are peers. They do not, they are not assigned specific tasks. So the multi-core CPU concept, which I am sure you know the rather well. A multi-core CPU means multi-processors on a single chip. In other words, we have one chip in which we have two or more CPU cores. So each CPU core is basically a CPU with its own register and caches. They communicate with memory through a system bus. However, the communication between the CPU cores would be more efficient because the communication is done within the same CPU. And it also consumes less power. So the newly uh, developed and released Apple Silicon M1 has even more integrated feature by moving memory into the same CPU becomes a very integrated one, saving even more power. If you used MacBook Pro and also uh, the MacBook M1 series, you'll know what would be the difference. So let's sum it up. Multi-core CPUs means each CPU has multiple cores. Each core is simply a CPU, but built into the same chip. The communication among the CPU cores are within the CPU as a result would be faster. And they also consume less power. Then we need some advanced support in order to make our uh, program execution uh, secure. The first concept we need to talk about is the so-called dual mode operation. This is actually not very new concept. It was there in the 60s. All modern CPUs have two execution modes, the user mode, and the supervisor mode. You should also refer to it as the system mode, the kernel mode, the privileged mode. How do we, how the CPU knows which mode it is in? There is a mode bits, or sometimes in some CPU, there could be multiple mode bits. So if the CPU is in the user mode, the mode bit would be Say, let's say we just have one more bit. So if the CPU is in 
in the supervised mode, it may be set to zero. And if the CPU is in the user mode, it's set to one. Some early IBM mainframes uh, has four more bit, at least four bits, meaning we have 16 combinations. Zero, 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 zero means the supervised mode. All the remaining value indicate one user mode. So we could run 15 users programs plus the operating system. So why do we use supervised mode and user mode? Simple. The, use, the operating system runs in the supervised mode and all user programs run in one of the several user mode. And if we have only one Mobit, then uh, when the Mobit is zero, it's run by the operating system because the CPU is in supervised mode. And if there's one, it means the CPU runs user programs in the user mode. So why must we do this uh, distinction? It's very simple. You do not want to ruin the operating system by a user program. There are so many ways in all system that a user can easily ruin the operating system. You can do it easily on the MS-DOS. And there an early microcomputer operating system called CPM control program. So the operating system resides in the higher end of memory. So in the 64K personal computer, the operating system usually resides in the upper 16K. The remaining 48Ks is you used to run the user program. And there's no protection. In other words, if you have a incorrect pointer pointing to the upper, uh, upper 16K, you can simply put something there and the operating system dies. So with uh, a Mobit, a user program runs and has a pointer uh, so that you could save something to an area that does not belong to that user, your program will be killed. That is usually give you a message saying uh, address, exception, bus error, and so on. Furthermore, some instructions may do harm to the operating system. What are these instructions? You will learn more in a computer architecture course, but we will cover a few. For an example, the input output instructions. If you are going to write in the machine instructions to write something into a disk, but you are not a very good uh, device driver programmer, you can easily make mistakes. Ruining the whole disk, erasing uh, the uh, directory, and so on. Or if there is no CPU, if you are allowed to change the CPU mode, then you could easily in your program uh, set the mode back to the supervisor mode. And then your program is run in the supervisor mode which can do whatever the operating system can do. Actually stealing uh, personal information and so on. So this is why in a, in a set of uh, machine instruction, there are instructions referred to as the privileged instruction. These privileged instructions, if used improperly, it could do harm to the operating system. These privileged instructions for most cases can only be used in the supervised mode. Just we stated here, changing, C, changing CPU mode by an instruction. That instruction has to be 
run in the supervisor mode. If it is allowed to run in the user mode, you can change the user mode back to the supervised mode and do whatever you want to do, including getting all malicious work done there. Therefore, because, because of some of the instruction can do harm to the operating system, these privileged instructions can only be run in the supervisor mode rather than in the user mode. When execution switches to the operating system from a user pro program, the operating system is responsible to set the mode to the supervisor mode. Before the operating system gives the control back to a user program, the operating system must set the mode bit to user mode. Otherwise, you hand the operating system over to the user and that user can do a whole lot of bad thing to an operating system. Now, the next important concept is interrupt and uh, traps. We will use this word uh, very, very frequently. I hope not only you understand what's going on, but also remember its definition. Although our definition is an intuitive one rather than a very formal one. You will learn this in either a computer organization or computer architecture courses. So here, an event that requires the attention of the operating system is referred to as an event. These events include the completion of an input output, a key press, a request for service, a division by zero, and so on. Now let's postpone our technical, technical discussion. Say you go to the Secretary of Service office and uh, the office is not there. He or she may be doing something in in the office, so you ring you ring the bell. When the bell sounds, the officer hears the ring bells, and then he or she stops his work, coming out and asking you, "How can I help you?" So ringing the bell is an interrupt sending to the office, indicating that there is an event that requires your attention. So this is the concept of an interrupt. So when ringing the bell will happen, unexpected, of course. For example, the operating system will not be able to predict when you will hit a key. And when your program running would have a division by zero. So all interrupt, all interrupt could happen in a very unexpected way at unexpected time. So here we always use this uh, intuitive definition. An event that requires the attention of the operating system is an interrupt. These events include the completion of input output, a key press, a request for service division by zero, and so on and so forth. So why I would say, I would say uh, completion of an input output in modern computers, the input output device and the CPU will run independently. For an example, you wish to write something to a disk, you ask the operating system to do it for you. So after the operating system receives your request, analyzes it, and then the operating system simply activate the IO routine. And that IO routine simply tells the input output device saying that please write such and such to the location on the disk. 
and then the operating system goes back. Handling the next service, or if there's no additional services need to be done, the operating system simply gives you uh, someone, the CPU, back to run their own program. So while the operating system is running other programs, the I.O. devices continues its work. So when that I.O. device completes its work, the I.O. device simply uh, generates an interrupt. This interrupt is referred to as the completion of an input output, an event that requires the operating system's attention. So operating system is notified, the operating system must handle this interrupt. So this is the meaning of completion of an input output. Interrupts may be generated by hardware or software. So interrupt is a large set. You could divide it into two parts. One generated by software, the other generated by non-software. But interrupt includes both. Therefore, interrupts generated by software is a subset of all interrupts. So an interrupt generated by software is referred to as a trap. So what kind of trap would be? Uh, division by zero, <clears throat> uh, you have an invalid pointer going outside of the area assigned to you. That is, you try to access an area in other program. And there are a whole lot of things. For an example, you hit a, you hit a control C, your program, uh, after some computation causing a floating point overflow or underflow. Look here, integer operations never gets overflow or underflow. Always remember that. When we talk about overflow and underflow, it's all about floating point computation. So trap is a subset of or interrupts. The subset of interrupt we call the trap are the, are the interrupts generated by software. Modern operating systems are interrupt driven, meaning that the operating system is in action only if an interrupt occurs. Basically, it goes as follows. Getting back to the secret of state's example. He or she, the clerk or the officer is the operating system. They have their job to do, paid by the federal government. So when you come in into the office of secret of state, you ring the bell, you actually generate an interrupt. And that event indicates that it requires the attention by the curl. So the curl goes out, serves, serves you. After serving you, they go back to their, their office doing their work. So this is basically operating systems working style. After you boot up the operating system, operating system would be sitting there, waiting for an interrupt to occur. When an interrupt occurs, operating system serves it. And then after serving that interrupt, operating system select a program to run. Give that program the control of the CPU. Of course, don't forget, we have to change the mode bit back from the supervised mode to the user mode. Then the operating system simply goes back and sit, sits there waiting for the next interrupt to happen. Here is a diagram showing to you 
what I said. This is the computer memory, and we have a division line. Above this line is the operating system. Below this line is a, a user program. I only show you one program. In modern days, this user error could run multiple programs. So the user program runs. Now you have to think of running but in terms of machine instructions rather than higher level instructions. In this course, if you always think the execution is going to be higher level language statement, you'll feel some pain because you won't be able to understand many concepts to be discussed later. So always think the execution in terms of machine instructions. So when this program runs to this at instruction, this is hypothetical instruction, irrelevant to any CPUs. So when the program reaches here, an interrupt occurs. Always remember, interrupt occurs at unpredictable moment. So when an interrupt occurs, the hardware, not the operating system, the hardware will automatically suspend the instruction being executed. And then automatically transfer the control to the kernel or the operating system. Once the operating system receives the control, who is going to receive this control? There is a routine called interrupt handler. So interrupt simply suspends the currently running program and automatically transfers control back to the kernel to the interrupt handler. That interrupt handler, the first job to do is set the mode bit to kernel mode. Then this interrupt handler collects all the needed information provided by the hardware. What kind of information the interrupt handler will receive? Of course, the address of this instruction. Because when the interrupt is served, control may return to this instruction. In addition to this, the hardware will provide the interrupt handler more information, such as what kind of interrupt it is, division by zero, a key press, or the completion of input output or something else, along with some other arguments. So the interrupt handler receives this information, analyzes it after determining what kind of uh, interrupt it just received, and then calls a service routine to serve that particular interrupt. After serving that interrupt, the last step is usually going through a component in, this, in the operating system, usually referred to as the CPU scheduler. If the operating system is running the service, then the operating system has the CPU in order to run. After finishing the service, the operating system does not need the CPU anymore. Therefore, the CPU can be given to a process. So which process is supposed to run? The system component called the CPU scheduler would find out which process can run. So then the uh, operating system before giving the control back to that, that process will set the mode switch back to the user mode and resume that suspended program. Always keep this in mind. Not only your program may be suspended, it is because your program can run, 
because you have the CPU. Other processes may also be suspended due to a previous uh, interrupt. So it's, suspe it's suspended and the operating system gives that CPU to you to run after serving that. So while your program is run, an interrupt occurs. So the control goes back to the operating system, the interrupt handler with a mode switch going from user back to, uh, to the kernel. After serving the interrupt, which may not be yours, the CPU scheduler picks a process to run, which is usually not this program. The program just uh, interrupted. Usually it's not that one. Which one will be picked? It's based on a whole lot of complex algorithm built into the CPU scheduler. So that process will be picked before returning to that suspended process. The kernel set the mode switch back to the user mode and uh, give the control back to that process. Now, a question you may think about, how do I know where to restart that suspended process, right? Correct. Remember this. When your program executes and the interrupt occurs at this statement, this machine instruction, then the address, or more correctly, the program counter indicating which instruction was there, will be recorded, also transferred to into the operating system. So after a few interrupts, the operating system may pick this program to run again because the address of the program counter pointing to here was recorded when this interrupt happened. So the operating system simply uh, changed mode bit from kernel mode to the user mode and execute a branch to this address. In this way, your program execution resumed. I hope you could watch this uh, segment or this very short discussion about this diagram multiple times to understand what would happen when an interrupt occurs. Now, many of you may have some incorrect concept for which I have to warn you. Interrupt occurs at unexpected time. You cannot call in general the interrupt to occur. Usually the only interrupt you can call to happen is a system call, which will be discussed a moment later. You can usually, from your basic knowledge, the only interrupt you can call to happen is the system call. Because a system call is called by your program. Therefore, a system call is an easy trap. So all the other um, or most of these interrupts are not called to happen. So never ever say you call an interrupt to happen, one. Secondly, interrupt is not executed. Interrupt is just an event. It's not a program instruction. Interrupt is not a command either. Interrupt is just an event that requires the operating system's attention. And finally, make sure interrupt, interrupts and the signals are two different things. Remember, we 
discuss the concept of signal. When we talk about S-I-G-K-I-L-L, signal, interrupt is an event to notify the operating system that something has occurred, that you have to pay attention to it. In an operating system, signal is something for the operating system to notify a user program that something has occurred, that you have to handle it. So interrupt the communication uh, to indicating an event has occurred to the operating system is the set of interrupt. And the notification going from the operating system to a user program is the set of signals. So signals are built into the operating system and interrupt. Many interrupt comes from outside devices, like modem, uh, IO devices, keyboard, and so many things. So always remember interrupts are not signal, at least from concurrent computing point of view and from operating systems point of view. Remember this, don't make this mistake. So let's move on to the next one, system calls. Most programmers do not know how to write many uh, work, such as input output, to a uh, to and from a disk. And even though how to directly reading something out of a disk, it's difficult to understand. Only a few those device driver programmers would know how to do it. Most of us simply write uh, F get S or some other open close calls. So most programmers do not write these service routines. Instead, the operating system, designers, programmers, programming the operating system wrote it for us. These are referred to as system calls. So system calls provide an interface between the operating system and uh, your program. The system calls simply tell you what kind of the services the operating system can provide you. So more powerful operating system would have more system services. In other words, they have more system calls. A system call generates an interrupt. Actually, it is a trap because it's called by a program. So this interrupt is generated by software. Therefore, a system call is an interrupt or a trap. So the process that calls a system call will be suspended. Control transfers into the operating system for the operating system to analyze what kind of system call you just called. And at the same time, serves until it's done. You, your process or someone else process may get a CPU. So what kind of system calls commonly used? One process control. We will talk about it uh, in the next part. Create a process, destroy a process, and so on. File management, open and close files. Device management, read or write operations or position. Uh, the uh, file pointer, information, maintenance, get the date or time of that date. We use it when we generate a, uh, the seed for random number. 
and communication, sending and receiving messages. So how at the very low level, a system core is carried out. Always think we are using a hypothetical machine language. So in most system, there is a convention or whole lot of convention depends on the operating system. Usually a register is dedicated as a pointer pointing to the argument list to be passed between uh, functions and uh, uh, from function to systems. This is very similar to the ARGV pointer. So when we call a system call, first of all, each system call has a number and a set of arguments. So what we need to do is before, before you call the system, you allocate an area in memory. This area could be defined as a structure. So this structure contains all the needed arguments or parameter for a particular system call, not only the information to be passed into the system call, but also you may need other argument to receive the results from a system call. Therefore, it's a, usually it's a big uh, data structure. So let the beginning address of this system call parameter be X. So to call a system call, we load the address into a register by convention. This register is just the arguments of pointing to ARGV, and this is the ARGV. After loading the address of the, of the arguments of ARGV, then we call the system call, followed by the, argu followed by the uh, system call number. Here I use 10. Not necessarily all system calls will be named SYS call. When I was IBM mainframe programmer, the system call instructions is SVC, supervisor call. So different CPU structure will have a different machine instruction to do that. But basically the calling pattern is approximately what we talk about, build argument vector. And before you call the system, load the address of the ARGV to a register following the system convention, and then call the system with the argument as the system call number. So when the control, after control is transferred into the operating system, the operating system analyze what the system call it is. So the system would eventually determine, the, okay, that is system call 10. So the system call 10 service routine will be called. This service routine would retrieve all the information to be passed into it through this register. Then this system service routine will perform all the needed work and to save all the needed resource back to your uh, ARGV list through this register. And then the service is done. The CPU scheduler is activated to pick up a suspended process for that process to continue, which may not be you, the one who called the system call. Now, here is the diagram we use to talk about interrupt. So this is a program. At this point, we call system call 10. Because system call is an interrupt, which is actually a trap because it is generated by 
software. So the hardware would pass the information into the kernel, the interrupt handler. This interrupt handler would receive the uh, uh, interrupt type, which is just call, and uh, the program counter. So the interrupt handler analyzes what kind of interrupt it is, and then calls the corresponding system call service routine to serve it. But always remember, the first thing for this interrupt handler to do is set the mode bit from user mode to supervisor mode or the kernel mode. Then the CPU scheduler picks a suspended process to run. And from the information to be discussed uh, next hour, the information can easily be retrieved. So that is a, the program counter of the suspend process. Then the CPU scheduler simply set the switch mode switch back from kernel mode or supervisor mode back to the user mode and execute a branch to that program counter. And that suspended pro process starts running. Notice here, the one, the process picked by the CPU scheduler after serving your system call may not be your process, maybe someone else. And you eventually get the CPU back. When? I don't know. And nobody knows. Only the CPU scheduler uh, can control which process can run next. So compare this diagram with the diagram we used to talk about interrupt. Hopefully, you understand the difference. Always remember there is a mode switch when an interrupt occurs going from the user mode into the kernel mode. After serving an interrupt, before getting control back to a suspended process, we have a mode switch going from the kernel back to the user. Okay, that ends our, our, our discussion of interrupt and uh, trap. The next thing we need to understand is timer. Now you can, if you have a Windows machine, you can do it uh, uh, with the following uh, experiments. You bring up a uh, MS-DOS window and write a C program with an infinite loop, a very simple one, while one. And in that loop, you do nothing, okay? So in Unix or Mac, you know to kill that program, it's very easy. Type control C, that program will be killed. But under MS-DOS or the earlier CPM80, this infinite loop program simply cannot be killed. So that infinite loop program will become a CPU hog. So how can we remove that CPU hog from the system or to prevent a process to eat up too much CPU cycle? This is important. This is very, very important. Uh, in scientific or engineering computation, some program may simply use large amount of CPU time. Once that program starts number crunching, that program probably uh, does not use much input output. They simply seize the CPU. But <clears throat> this type of program is referred to as CPU bound because they use more CPU time than doing the time uh, for input output. But in business data processing, most programs 
would use more the input output than doing number crunching. Uh, Donald Knuth, a very well-known figure in computer science, you should have heard his name, did a research in the 70s, I don't remember, probably 70s. He reported that in a typical data processing center, approximately 40% uh, of, of CPU time or even more will be spent on sorting. Now, this sorting is different from what you have learned in a data structure course. In a data structure course, you learn sorting like bubble sort, insertion sort, and uh, uh, quick sort, hip sort, it's all in memory sorting. That is all data items have been read into memory. But can you sort millions of data in physical memory or even in virtual memory? It's probably not due to several reasons. First of all, you sort integers. You only sort one integer, four bytes or eight bytes. But in business data processing, you are not only sorting that integer, that in integer is probably just part of a very large data structure. That data structure may be 1K or 2K. And that integer may be uh, household income or your social security number and so on. So say one record would cost you 1K then one million record, uh, that's going to be very large. So the sorting techniques is usually referred to as external sorting. The data would be stored on disk. When it's needed, the data will be read into uh, physical memory after uh, some time, the partially sorted data would be written back to the disk and going in and out so many times producing so many input output operation. Do you remember while a program is doing input output, that program cannot run. So while the CPU is in idle state, will run a second program. So these programs that will do whole lot of input output operations are referred to as IO bound program. Now, if the CPU bank program is running, then this IO bank program would have no, not much choice to get a CPU and run. On the other hand, if a whole lot of IO bank programs are running, they simply read something in and after uh, 100, 200 instructions, they start the input output. So yielding the CPU to next process. So an operating system management or the key operator sitting in front of a console. Frequently monitor the mix of the CPU bound job and the IO bound job. Now, what if the CPU bound job is a CPU hawk? Just like what I mentioned, the infinite loop program running in under MS-DOS. You have no way to get out of CPU. Therefore, we introduce a concept called a timer. There are two types of timers in modern uh, hardware. The first one is referred to as the real timer, just like a watch. So this real time timer simply ticks, just like our watch. Another timer is referred to as interval timer. Sometimes it's also referred to as countdown timer. How do we use it? Before a user program runs, for an example, the CPU scheduler picks a suspended process to run. Before that program runs, the operating system set interval timer to a certain value. 
once the interval timer uh, start counting and the, the uh, suspended program resumed, the interval timer counts down. Say uh, 199, 98, 97, and so on. Once the countdown to zero, an interrupt is generated by the interval timer. At that moment, the operating system will be activated to take care of this interval timer interrupt. So operating system get uh, cut in, and of course that CPU hard will be stopped. In this way, the interval timer is the feature of an interval timer can uh, can stop a uh, CPU bound program at any moment as long as we set interval timer properly. The time for the for a interval timer to start counting down is referred to as a time quantum. How large this time quantum is depends on your CPU speed. If your CPU speed is very slow, the time quantum may be larger and CPU speed is fast, then the time quantum should be uh, small. How to set these values is the job of the system administrator. Uh, administrator. So anyway, before your pro program or your process can get the CPU, the operating system set the interval timer. So as your program is running on the CPU, the interval timer starts counting down. Once it counts down to zero, a timer interrupt occurs. Operating system takes over the hardware automatically suspend your program. So no matter what, as long as your system has an interval timer, CPU hogs will never happen because the operating system uh, can set interval timer and intervene at any time. Then we are going to talk about something lengthy. This is between computer organization and a computer architecture. But my intention is not to repeat um, what you have learned in computer organization or you will learn or you have learned from a computer architecture course. I try to be more intuitive. The reason we cover this is simple. We need it, but we don't need the expertise in a computer architecture course. What is it up all about? It's the execution of a machine instruction. Usually, the CPU execute a machine instruction uh, involves three stages, fetch, decode, and execute. This fetch, decode, execute cycle was known to very early computer in, in, in the early 60s. So this is referred to fetch, decode, execute cycle. The CPU fetch and instruction into CPU. The decode stage simply analyze the fetch instruction to determine what the operation code is and what the operands are. And then execute the operation uh, corresponding to the decoded operation code. But here we follow a more modern five stage discussion. What are needed here, load operands and saves, okay? So fetch means loading the next instruction into the CPU. Decode means analyzing the fetched instruction and determining the operation code, OP code, and the operands. These operands could be uh, a registers or memory locations or something else. Now, once we know the operands, we load operands, that is loading the contents of operands from memory and the register 
into CPU. So once we get all the values of operands and the register into the CPU, we move to the next stage. The next stage simply executing needed operations to obtain the results. Now the results are computed, we have to save it back. That is the last stage. The computer re results back to the register and memory, depending on whether the target location is. So now we have a five stage cycle, fetch, decode, load operation, operands, execute, and uh, save. Let's take a look at an example. Again, I don't want to bother you with actual machine instruction. I always use hypothetical instruction. Let's take a look at this one. Add, followed by three operands. This notation is a register. So this means we add the contents in memory A and the contents in register one and save the resource to memory location B. Now for simplicity, this would always be uh, after it's translated to machine instruction, it's simply a bit sequence. Let's say add the corresponding sequence to add is one, one, zero, one, 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 zero, one. And the remaining thing, we don't care. So after translation, uh, we have the OP code here. A would be a memory location here. R1 may be represented by something indicating that is register one, followed by the address to B. So that is in machine instruction form, a bit pattern. Now, traditionally, we have the following five stage. Assuming that the current value in A's location is 10, in B's location is unknown, it could be garbage, and the, the value in register one is four. Now let's execute the previous instruction. First, the time goes from left to right. So the CPU fetch the instruction in, that is simply copy the bit pattern from memory to CPU. Then the we move on to the next stage, decode. The decode stage analyzes the speed pattern and find out what is the OP code, which is ADD at. What are the operands, uh, memory A, register one and memory B. Then the next stage would be, let's get the results in. We need to add these two together and put the results here. So we need to load the value of A, which is 10 from memory and load the value uh, four from register one. So the values for both operands are loaded into CPU. Then we execute it by adding 10 and four together to get 14 the result. But this 40 is not in the memory yet, that's in B. So we save it back to B. After doing that, B would have 14. So this is a traditional uh, early computer form. We fetch, we decode, load operands, execute and save the operand. After this instruction is done, we fetch the next instruction, decode it and load operand, execute it and finally save the results and go back for the next one and so on. Now notice here at any time in the CPU, only one stage CPU is built upon these five stages. In this diagram, you notice that at any time, only one stage is busy. The remaining four stages are idle. So in this case, the fetch one is busy. The remaining four stages are idle. In when the instructions move to decode, the fetch stage is idle, the decode stage is busy, and the remaining three are idle. 
So once you notice that, if you still remember, uh, we mentioned this concept over and over. To maximize concurrency, why don't we do this? When this instruction moves the code, and we could fetch the next instruction in. And when this uh, instruction moves to from decode to op load operands, the next fetch instruction could move to decode. Then we could fetch the third instruction. So making these five stages operates in a concurrent way. Hope you understand this concept. It's simply like uh, when the CPU is idle, we fit another program in so that we could run multiple programs. In this case, we are able to run five instructions at various stage at the same time. This is referred to as a CPU pipeline. Let's take a look at an example before we go into this uh, deeper concept. So we have five instructions at these two, put the results here, at these two, put results here, and so on. And the instruction pattern will be listed here. It's just for showing to you the pattern. It needs nothing because we still interpret each instruction uh, in this way. So let's go through this sequence. So the initial value is for A is 10, B is 40, and C, we don't know, maybe garbage. The, the contents in register one is four, contents in register two is five. Okay, now let's run the first instruction first add. We add the contents in A, the contents in uh, register one, and put the results in B. So contents in A and contents in register one, we add them together, the resource is 14. 14 goes back to B. We use both phase to indicate the results. Then we execute next add. We add a value in register one and register two and put the results back to nine. Now to register two, we have nine. And then we execute the third instruction, multiplying B and the register two together, uh, we have the result 126 and the save to C. And then we multiply again mu by multiplying R1 and the value of C here and put the results back to register two. Finally, we subtract the value of B from the value in register two and the, re and the results goes back to A. So we have 490. So at the end of the execution of this five state uh, instruction, we have 490 for A, 14 for B, 126 for C, four for register one and 504 for register two. Remember this, and uh, if it is needed, simply jot it down. Now, what if we run this five instruction on a CPU in a concurrent way. That is, we apply the pipeline and the CPU to do that. It's rather complex, but I'll try to be slower. Here shows you the instructions. Here shows you the values initially. Now, I, do, I did not complete all the execution. I hope after this lecture, you'll complete for yourself. So we execute the first instruction, the fetch stage. Getting all the bit pattern, the first instruction add into memory. And then this red arrow indicates it goes to the next stage, the decode stage. Okay, we found out, okay, the OP code is add operand. Operands are A, register one and B. Look at here. And then after decode, now we move to the next one, loading the contents of uh, the operands. A is 10, register is four. After loading it, please follow the red arrow. We add 10 and four together to become 14. And finally, we'll put the results back to B. So this 14 
updates the speed 40 here. Okay, so this is the first instruction. You don't see much trouble. Now, if we have a pipeline, while the first instruction is being decoded, we could load the next instruction in. This one, it two, adding the register one and register two and put the results back to register two. So when the first instruction moves to loading operand, the second instruction could move to decode. So after decoding, we know the operand is at, uh, OP code is at, the operand would be number one, num register one, register two, and register two. And then when the first instruction moves to execute, the uh, load operand, uh, the uh, decode, would move to load operand. Now register one is four, register two is five. So when the first instruction move to the last stage, save the result, the, uh, the second instruction go into the execute stage that is adding four and a five to become nine. So when this guy goes out, nine would be picked would be saved back to register two. So when the second, the second instruction is being decoded, the fetch stage becomes idle. So we could fetch the third instruction in. When the third instruction moves to the decode stage, so we could fetch the fifth, the fourth instruction. When the, uh, this instruction the third instruction moved to the next stage, we could fetch the fifth instruction in. So in that way, the, at this moment, all stages of this CPU pipelines are fully reloaded and busy. But do you see some issues? I would suggest that you go through this diagram pause and the think. Here is a hint. Watch for the value of B. Okay, give you a hint. And hopefully you'll go through it. Now, the first add instruction, save B back to here, overwriting original value 40. But this instruction, the second instruction does not use add. The third instruction would use results of B computed by the first instruction. This was shown to you uh, on the previous slide. Unfortunately, the value of this B, 40, was loaded here, which is wrong because when what we need is the value of 14 rather than 40. Please pause and uh, go through these diagrams. Watching for the value of B, how B is saved when the old value of B was loaded. This instruction here, decode and the load operand. So definitely in this case, the computer result is incorrect. So here, B is supposed to be computed here and used here. By the same reason, C is computed here and used here. So please finish at least this five stage before you continue. Here, we show you the issue with B. After this lecture, I hope you could go through everything and see the issue with the value C. Please pause. Now, if you still cannot see that, don't worry. Here is a simpler example. We have two add instruction. A, A plus B results in C. 
B plus C results in D. So currently the value of A, B, C are two, six, and seven. And the value of D currently is unknown. So what we expect would be 14 in D because the sum of A and B is eight. Eight goes into C. And C is here and B is six. Six plus A is 14. This 14 should go into D, right? Now let's use this the pipeline. Time flies from left to right. We load the first at instruction. The first instruction goes into the, uh, the decode stage. We know the operands are A and B and then load the value of A and B, that's two and six. We add two and six together to become eight and then we save eight to C, uh, that's fine. While the first instruction is in decode stage, we load the second instruction in, which is the second add. And when the first instruction moves to loading our pre-operant stage, the second stage moves to decode stage. Okay, that's an add with operands B and C. When the first instruction moves into the execute stage, the second instruction moves to the loading operand stage. A is six, B is seven, that's fine so far. But is it fine? Oh, here it should be a, a B and C. I would make a change. Then we add six and seven together to become 13. And finally, when the second add finishes, the value of D is 13 rather than the 14 we expected. The reason is in this execution, before C is saved, to location C. We have already loaded the old value, the unupdated value in the pipeline of C. That's the issue. And this is referred to data hazard. Whether you learn it in computer architecture, doesn't matter. It will definitely be discussed in computer architecture. So, it means instruction depends on the results of prior instructions. Still then, pipeline. That is, we need the value of C, which, is co which was computed in the previous instruction. But this value, when we load this value, this value was just computed while this value is being co computed, the old value of C has been already loaded. So we did not use the correct value of C for the second get instruction. So we do have problem. Now, the previous uh, slides simply shows you what the concept of CPO pipeline is. How to resolve this data hazard uh, issue is none of our business. In computer architecture, in a compiler course, you will learn how to deal with it. However, some instructions are so crucial to concurrency. One of these instructions is compare and swap, usually written as CS. This instruction is not so simple as add, sub, subtract, and so on. So I can only rewrite it in a function form. The CS instruction requires a pointer and two values. So the acti activity in the compare and swap instruction goes as follows. We compare the value stored in P and the value given as a second operand as in old. If the values are not equal, this instruction returns false. And if they are equal, we use the third argument to update the value stored in P and returns true. This instruction looks very odd. 
actually, I I learned another instruction while I was a uh, programmer. That is test and set instruction. We will discuss test and set when we uh, talk about synchronization. Someday, while I was waiting for a large program to finish in a uh, data center, that program may run three to four hours. So I was bored, not interested in playing any game. So I go to the data center's library and simply flip through IBM system manual. In particular, I try to overcome a problem which will be discussed uh, sometime later, not today. So suddenly I found an instruction called a TS, which is a very similar to this one. When you look at this instruction, you probably would have a feeling that what the heck it is. It does something I can easily do with my C program. I simply compare these two if they are equal and then an, a, an, a, a if and then assign this value to here. And if they are not equal, I simply do nothing. But look here, the whole function has to be implemented in a single machine instruction. I was so puzzled. I talked to the system programmer, the chief, neither of them understood what's going on because they didn't use it. And then I tried to find some literature from IBM mainframe library. Eventually I found out, my goodness, and that instruction is for synchronization. And that inspired me to get into concurrency. So always remember these comparison assignment and return values are to be executed as a single instruction rather than a something simple as add, subtract and so on. So let me show you an example here, how this instruction can be used. Look here, CS is supposed to be an instruction running on a machine that support multiple processes running at the same time, just like current today's uh, Linux. So look at this very short program. Initially, I set the variable done to false. So as long as the value of done is false, I execute this loop. And first of all, in each iteration, as long as done is false, indicating it's not my updating, it's not done. I copy the value from P to a local value. value. And then I execute the CS instruction. The CS instruction simply compare these two values. If they are equal, then the, the value stored in P would be updated by the current value plus the value of X. If they are not equal, then CS return false. And I have to look for the next time. So the meaning of this short loop is I want to update the value pointed at by the point of P. But the update can only be done if the copy the value in value and the, the value in P where the CS is being executed are the same. This value is updated by, P will be updated by this value if the value is the same. You may wanna say, how could that be? I copied the value here. How could that be? That is, the two value would become not equal. Well, yes. If you run multiple processes, each of which may have to, may want to update this one. For an example, your process and my process, try to update the value at P. So, 
if I am here, because if we have only one CPU, your process and my process would be executed in an interleaved way. It is very, very probable that after I copy the value in P to my local variable value, the operating system suspended my program, say due to an interrupt. Then after serving the interrupt, the operating system picks your program to run. So by the time my program is allowed to resume, you may have already changed value in P. In this case, the value I copied to value, my local variable, and that the actual value you stored in P would be different. Then updating the value in P would be incorrect. Therefore, this very simple loop, simple loop indicates that only if the copied value and the copied value and the current value are equal, I can update the value stored in P. Now you see, this is the concurrency involved in interrupt or inter interleave execution. So this start your headache very soon because we frequently apply this concept to our discussion. So let me quickly go through it. There could be an interrupt here and my program is suspended. Say suppose the current value stored in P and when I copy it is 10, then value would be 10. Now, because of an interrupt, my program is suspended your program start running, your program would also have access to the location P. Then you update it to say uh, 15. So when my program is resumed, the value in P is 15. And uh, the old copy, the value is 10. Now 15 and a 10 are not equal. Therefore, I should not use this value, the copy the value to update 15. I should use your 15 to make an update. That's the key concept. So this is what the compare and the swap instructions is used. We try to make sure the update to a shared variable, again, what you hear shared, that's going to be a very troublesome headache. Is the uh, compare and swap instruction is commonly used to establish to establish synchronization. So let's take a look at example to clarify more. Let's say suppose current value of P is 10. Now we have two processes, two program P1 and P2. P1 has a local variable X, P2 has a local variable Y. So they simply essentially does the same, copy the value from P to a local variable and execute a compare and swap, compare these two. If they are equal, then P would be updated by the current value plus one. If they're not equal, I look back, try again. Then in program two, it's it does the same, copy the value from P to Y. And if the value in P and the value in Y are the same, we update the value in P by Y plus two. Always remember due to interrupt or timer, processes P1 and P2 will be executed in an interleaved way. The easiest interleave execution would be Process one finish one and two before process two starts. So the interleaving would be one, two, followed by three and four, the easiest one. But the trouble is, mean, the trouble part is P1 execute one and then switched out due to whatever reason, say an interrupt and the system allows P2 
to execute before P1 can execute two. What would happen? Let's take a look at. Now, example, P1 finishes job before P2 stop. So P1 copy the value from uh, P to 10. This is the value of X, this is the value in P. So because value in X and the value in P are the same, therefore the update will be successful. So the value of P is 11. Then for P2, after P1 completes P2 stops, P2 copies the value of 11 to its local variable e, uh, Y and then execute CS. So this CS compares the value in P, the value in Y, and if they are equal, then update the value in P by Y plus two. Now currently this Y and the P are equal. So after CS, the value in P is updated by 13. So this is, there is no interleaving in this case. Uh, P1 finishes followed by P2. That is P2 starts after P1 finish. Now let's take a look at this interleaved way. P1 starts with the first statement and copy the value of P to X. And then whatever happened, the system suspends P1 and the allows P2 to continue. So P2 copy the value in P to its local variable Y. And then the system, probably crazy. Suspend P2, probably just say right after this is done, there is before it can continue and interrupt occurs. Then the system gives the control back to P1. P1 compare P and X, okay? P, the current the value was 10 and, uh, and X, so it's updated to 11. But the value in P current uh, in Y is currently still 10. So when P2 start executes, P2 compare the value of Y and P. Y is 10, P is 11, which is not equal. So P2 fails to update the value because the Y the assignment for Y and the execution of CS in a uh, while loop. So P2 could come back and later and update again. But if these four instructions will continue over and over that P2 may not, may have a less chance to have its own successful update. So this is very important concept. So now let's take a look at, uh, previously we did not use pipeline. What if those two processes run on a CPU with pipeline? Uh, the problem is even more complex. Let's say uh, the first CS starts and then decode it. We, we know uh, the operand would be P old and new. So we copy the value of P10, the old value is uh, stored in X and the new value is X plus one, 11. And then we execute and then 11 is stored in P. So first SCS is fine. Now, if the CPU has pipeline, when the first instruction moves into the code, the second CS instruction moves to fetch and then decode. And then we load the operands in 10 into P and 10 into Y and update value should be 12. Notice here the value copied into P is not the result here. It's still the old value. And then we execute. Ah, we get a value 12 because these two are equal. And then we use 12 to update it. So we have a 
totally different result. We've seen 1138 and some, some others. So as you can see, with pipeline feature, uh, the situation could become more complex. Now, what if both instructions are run on different CPUs? So CPU one runs the first CS, CPU two runs the second one. So they both decode and they both uh, load the operands in and execute again. Uh, CPU one would get P equals 11, CPU two would get 12. But what would be the final value in P. Actually, if CPU one runs a bit faster than CPU two, CPU one would put 11 into P and then CPU puts 12 into P. So the result is 12. Conversely, if CPU two runs a bit faster, CPU two updates P with 12, then CPU one updates P with 11. So that depends on CPU speed. So to overcome these problems, we did a new type of machine instruction to avoid these issues. In particular, the issues we discussed with the compare and the swap instruction. So these are the so-called atomic instruction. This atomic instruction run essentially the same as a CPU without a pipeline feature. So the definition of the atomic instruction is here. Atomic instructions execute without interleaving and can, cannot be split by other instructions. When an atomic instruction is recognized by the CPU, all other instructions being executed in various states by the CPU are suspended and perhaps reissued later until this atomic instruction finishes. Furthermore, while, they see, while the in atomic instruction is executed in the CPU, no interrupt can occur. Now, let me go through it quickly. Atomic instruction must execute in a CPU without interleaving and can, cannot be split by other instruction. When a CPU recognizes a atomic instruction, all instructions uh, being executed in various stages by the CPU are suspended until the current, uh, the, uh, the found atomic instruction completes. After that, some instruction may be reissued, some operand may be refetched. While an atomic instruction is in execution, no interrupt can happen. And if two instructions are issued at the same time, even on different CPU, say we saw this example, two CS instructions are run on CPU one and CPU two at the same time. Actually, the compare and swap instructions is an atomic one. So if two atomic instructions are run on different CPU, the hardware, the hardware would only allow one to run. Say, suppose I have four CPUs. Three of these four, at the same time, encounters a, a machine, a atomic instruction. So these three uh, atomic instructions will be forced to execute one by one. So previously we saw two compare and swap run on two CPU at the same time Bec because compare and swap are atomic. Therefore, these two CPUs, only one of them can execute a uh, CS instruction. After that first uh, 
after this CS instruction finishes execution, the second one could run. We don't know whether the order would be the first, uh, the CS1 followed by CS2 or CS2 followed by CS1. The hardware could pick it up in an arbitrary order. Now, let's explain the whole thing in an intuitive way. An atomic instruction means do this operation alone. Only I can do things. I am the dictator. Everyone, please, goes away. And don't get in, interrupt while doing this. When a CPU recognizes an, an atomic instruction, it is the only instruction running in the CPU, and all other instructions are stopped. Furthermore, interrupts are not allowed to happen. When this atomic instruction completes, other instructions and operands may have to be reissued, going from very beginning, from fetch, or reloaded. The operand may have to be reloaded. How do you do it? Doesn't matter. We just make sure when the atomic instruction is run, all other instruction will be stopped. No interrupt can occur. When, when this atomic instruction finishes, then this instruction, you just consider they will run from the very beginning or operands will be reloaded. That is a safer uh, assumption. Although uh, in reality, it's not done that way. You will learn more in a computer architecture class. We only here provide an intuitive discussion that's good enough for this course. We don't want to go into the deep details because you're going to learn that uh, next year or next semester. Now, in this class, we will discuss atomic instruction, the TS, test and set instruction for synchronization purpose. The previously discussed uh, compare and swap the CS instruction is another commonly seen example. Without this atomic instruction, race computation could occur when instructions modify a shared memory location. At the same time, we have seen it. Two instructions try to get the value in and out, and before I can update, you have already changed it, or loaded, and so on. So the last concept is privileged instruction. We discuss it when we talk about uh, CPU mode. These instructions in, net, in general are instruct, instructions like that can do harm to the operating system or uh, executing processes. Privileged instruction can only be executed when the CPU is in the supervisor mode or kernel mode. And furthermore, most of these atomic instructions like TS and, and the comparison swap could only be used in supervisor mode. However, in modern Intel CPUs, uh, Intel allows a user program to use this privileged instruction in some way. So it's not always used in the supervisor mode or the kernel mode. Okay, we finally reached the end of this part. Here, we learn a few important concepts. The first one is CPU mode. And we also talk about why CPU mode is needed and when CPU mode has to be switched. The next important concept is interrupt and the traps. System call was also discussed. System call is a trap. Then we say long discussion to discuss uh, fetch decode and the uh, um, execute cycle. We use example to show you various uh, very annoying effect for modern CPU with pipeline. From there, we learn a very important concept, 
We called it atomic instruction. Atomic instructions are instruction when it is executing the CPU or other instruction executing the CPU must be stopped until this atomic instruction finishes. During the execution of this inter, uh, atomic instruction, no interrupt is allowed to happen. Then after this uh, atomic instruction finishes, those suspend instructions and that their loaded operand may have to be reloaded and refetched. These are the important concepts. We will use atomic instructions to interrupt a system calls, CPU mode and the uh, uh, traps over and over again in this course. So I hope you will review this uh, video when this necessary, or when you forget what some concept is, go back and watch this part. The next component would be the concept of process and how to write multi-process program. So that's all for this lecture. See you next time. Goodbye.